Hello again. My name is Dr. Jacob Graham, and in this video we will wrap up our two-voice counterpoint exercises by looking at invertible counterpoint. As you composed melodies for your species exercises above and below the given melody, it may have occurred to you that maybe there was a way to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, by composing just one melody that works equally well whether it is placed above or below the cantus firmus. There is a way to do that. In fact, there is more than one way, and we will call these methods invertible counterpoint, or sometimes double counterpoint. Invertible counterpoint is not really an essential part of tonal voice leading, but it is instead most useful if you want to continue on in learning how to compose what's called imitative counterpoint, canons and fugues and stuff like that, where the melodies would frequently pass between voices in the texture. Back in our first video on one-to-one -one counterpoint, we encountered an example that almost works as invertible counterpoint. Here's the counter melody that Schubert composed above Salieri's Dorian Cantus Firmus. And here's the melody that Schubert composed as a solution below the Cantus Firmus. You can see that the lower melody is almost an exact transposition of the upper counterpoint melody down one octave, except for this note. In the lower melody, Schubert chooses a D natural instead of C sharp. The reason for this becomes clear when we write out the harmonic intervals that both melodies form with the Cantus Firmus. We can make a little chart of what will happen to each interval when we transpose down by one octave. As we can see in the first measure, an octave will invert to a unison, and we can complete the chart by counting down from 8 to 1 in the top row and counting up from 1 to 8 in the bottom row. An octave inverting to a unison is not a compositional problem, since both of those intervals are perfect consonances and are likely to be treated in the same way. Maybe we want to avoid downbeat unisons more than downbeat octaves, but they're treated basically the same way. Seconds and sevenths are both dissonances, and thirds and sixths are both imperfect consonances, so inverting them will also work out just fine. But the main problem of invertible counterpoint at the octave comes when we try to invert a fourth to a fifth, or vice versa. Fourths are dissonant and cannot be used in the same way as our perfect fifths. That is why Schubert composed that C sharp above the A in the Cantus Firmus. He wasn't able to invert the bass note D to be above A, since this would form a fourth, which is a harmonic dissonance that can't be used in a one-to-one -one counterpoint exercise. Notice that the intervals that are larger than an octave, in this case these tenths, produce voice crossings when transposed down by an octave. The fact that the lower voice crosses above the cantus firmus for these measures is shown with negative signs in front of their intervals. Some authors, including Fuchs, believe intervals larger than an octave should be avoided in exercises that focus on invertible counterpoint at the octave since they will always produce these kinds of voice crossings, and since the intervals used don't show up on our chart. But voice crossings are not, strictly speaking, a voice leading error, and I really like tenths, so I don't see anything wrong with using them. The point of all of this is that we can be sure that our florid melodies will invert successfully as long as we treat all of our perfect fifths as if they are dissonant, so that they behave correctly as dissonances when they are inverted into fourths. I think of it a little bit like a what-if story from comic books. What if someone other than Peter Parker was bitten by the radioactive spider? What if these heroes were actually villains, right? What we're going to do is compose a normal florid melody, just like we learned in our previous video, but with two additional twists thrown in. The first is, what if perfect fifths were actually dissonant? That's not so difficult to do, and I'll go through the implications of that in a moment. The second twist is, 
that we have to begin and end our exercises on scale degree 1. We don't have the option of beginning on a different scale degree anymore, since we need this melody to work as a bass line, so we have to begin and end on the tonic. So, now that we find ourselves in a bizarro world where fifths are actually dissonances, let's try to imagine some situations where a fifth could be generated as one of the three kinds of voice-leading dissonances. Here's an example of a fifth arising as a passing tone, approached and left by step in the same direction, and occurring on a weak beat. When we invert the melody down an octave, the sixth becomes a third, the fifth becomes a well-behaved passing tone fourth, and the third becomes a sixth. It's also pretty easy to come up with an example of a fifth behaving as a neighbor tone. The interval of a sixth is a consonance that is a step away from a fifth, so any 6-5-6 six, six consonant neighbor pattern will invert to a well-formed 3-4-3 three, three dissonant neighbor pattern. It's a little bit trickier to come up with an example of a fifth prepared and resolved as a suspension, since when it resolves down by step on beat 3, it must move to a dissonant fourth, which itself needs to be justified as some kind of voice-leading dissonance. In this case, the fourth is justified as an accented passing tone from A to F. When we invert the melody below, we get a properly prepared 4-5 suspension. Invertible counterpoint at the octave is really not so difficult. All we have to do is to make sure that our fifths are treated as one of these three types of voice-leading dissonance. Before you go on to compose your own exercises using any of the cantus firmi that we've looked at in previous videos, let's look quickly at the example given by Fuchs in Gratus ad Parnassum. Fuchs chooses the simplest path forward by just avoiding the interval of a fifth almost entirely. He only includes one of them here as part of a 6-5-6 six, six neighbor pattern. When Fuchs inverts the melody, the neighbor pattern becomes 3-4-3, three, three, and the dissonant fourth fits perfectly. When composing imitative counterpoint, things like canons and inventions and fugues, it is often useful to know how our melodic materials will work when the voices are inverted by an interval other than an octave. The most common types are invertible counterpoint at the tenth, which is an octave plus a third, or the twelfth, which is an octave plus a fifth. To figure out how inverting at the tenth works, we can construct a chart of intervals and their inversions, exactly like we did before. One nice thing about inverting at the tenth is that all of the dissonant intervals invert into other dissonant intervals. But when we look closely, we will see that all of the imperfect consonances will invert into perfect consonances and vice versa. That means, for instance, that a melody that has a chain of lovely parallel sixths will invert into a chain of not-so-lovely parallel fifths. To compose a melody that will correctly invert at the interval of a tenth, we will need to treat all of our imperfect consonances as if they already are perfect. In other words, what would counterpoint look like if all consonances were perfect? Also, our exercises written above the cantus firmus 
we'll need to begin and end on scale degree 3 this time, so that when we invert below, our baseline can begin and end on scale degree 1. Here is an example of an exercise written in invertible counterpoint at the 10th. Beginning and ending on scale degree 3 feels very weird, and I found that the best way to end the exercise was to use this quarter note cadential formula borrowed from our 4 to 1 exercises. Since we are treating all consonances as perfect, it means that none of the downbeat consonances through the entire exercise can be approached in direct motion, either parallel or similar. Every downbeat must be approached either through contrary motion or as a suspension, which will result in oblique approach to the downbeat. And when we transpose the melody down by the interval of a tenth, we have a workable bass line that begins and ends on scale degree 1. Now, here's a pretty cool example by Fuchs. This counterpoint actually works when inverted both by an octave and by a tenth. We can tell already that it will work when inverted at the octave, because it begins and ends on scale degree 1, and there is only one harmonic fifth, and it functions as a passing tone. We can see that the melody also works as a bass line, although Fuchs does seem to overuse the perfect unison near the beginning. Then Fuchs shows how the original melody also works when inverted by a tenth. We can check that this will work by noticing that each of the downbeats is approached either by contrary motion or by oblique motion via a suspension. But Fuchs's melody begins and ends on scale degree 1, which means that when we transpose down by a tenth, our new bass line will begin and end on a different scale degree which will entail a change of mode. With the bass line beginning and ending on A, the passage now sounds like it's in A minor. For his last trick, Fuchs also points out that you can combine the original melody with the inverted one to create a working three-voice texture. The outer voices move exclusively in parallel tenths, of course, but other than that, the exercise breaks none of the rules of strict counterpoint. 
This recombination into three voices will work for any melody that is invertible at the tenth. Invertible counterpoint at the twelfth is especially important when composing fugues, since very often the melodic materials of the subjects and countersubjects are transposed by fifth, and end up being rearranged in various ways later on in the composition. When we construct a chart to see how our harmonic intervals will invert at the interval of a twelfth, we see that perfect twelfths invert to perfect unisons. Dissonant elevenths invert to seconds, tenths invert to thirds, ninths invert to fourths, and octaves invert to fifths, everything's working out perfectly, until we see that dissonant sevenths invert to imperfect sixths. So close. You can probably already guess what the main themes are for this form of invertible counterpoint. We can ask ourselves, what would counterpoint look like if sixths were dissonant? And we will need to begin and end our upper voice exercises on scale degree 5 this time, so that they can begin and end on scale degree 1 when inverted into a bass line. If we are going to treat our sixths as if they are dissonant, then they need to be generated as one of the three kinds of voice leading dissonances. We can easily come up with a situation where a sixth could arise as a passing tone, since the fifth is a stepwise adjacent consonance. A 5-6-5 neighbor note pattern will also invert to a correct 8-7-8 pattern for the same reason. The suspension, though, is a little trickier. If a sixth is going to be suspended, it needs to resolve down by step to a harmonic fifth, and it's easy enough to come up with an example of how that would work. But when we transpose the counterpoint below our cantus firmus, we notice that the 6 5 suspension inverts to a 7 8, which is unfortunate, because that kind of bass suspension is usually not allowed. That means our upper counterpoint should not have 6 5 suspensions, but should only have sixths that are generated either as a passing tone or as a neighbor note. Here is Fuchs's example of invertible counterpoint at the twelfth. We see that he only uses the interval of a sixth on two occasions, and both times they function as passing tones. His counterpoint begins and ends on scale degree 5, A, and near the end he even raises the penultimate note G to a G sharp. You can think of this as a leading tone that is borrowed from the key of A minor. And when we invert our melody, this accidental is going to invert to the leading tone in the correct key of D minor. And finally, here is the inverted melody. That's all for this video. Stay tuned for the next one where we will introduce chords and counterpoint in three voices.